Rosanna Galliano was having dinner with her sister Monica in the living room of her house in El Remanso Exaltación de la Cruz when her phone rang. It was her husband, Jose Arts, calling to say he was running late to pick up their sons, Geronimo and Nehuen, ages four and three. Rosanna answered the call but, struggling to hear, stepped out into the garden to talk. As she tried to communicate with Jose, a figure emerged from the trees, took a few steps toward her, and pulled out a gun. The assailant fired six shots, leaving 29-year-old Rosanna's body just steps from her home, struck by four bullets. Rosana Galliano was born in the late 1970s in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She was the youngest child, with two brothers named Oscar and Gustavo, and a sister named Monica. Her parents were Reynaldo and Graciela. The details of her childhood and teenage years are a bit of a mystery, but it's known that she finished high school in the late 90s. During this time, Rosana's dad, Reynaldo, worked as a mechanic. Early in 2001, Jose Arch showed up at Reynaldo's workshop. Jose was born on November 22, 1948. He had lived abroad for over 30 years, in places like Greece and the United States, where he even spent four years in prison for drug trafficking. Eventually, Jose returned to Argentina in 1996, owning eight properties in a posh area of Buenos Aires. Jose and Rosana met when he brought his vintage car for repairs at her father's shop. Despite the significant age difference, they started dating quickly. At that time, Rosana was unemployed and quite reserved. Jose appeared to be financially stable, but in reality, his wealth came from his mother, Elsa, who was still in the United States. When Jose at the age of 52, proposed to 22-year-old Rosana, her mother Graciela questioned if he was too old for her daughter. Jose argued that love knew no age. Looking for assurance, Graciela turned to Rosana, who, in a whisper, confirmed her desire to marry him. The couple got married on November 17, 2001, after just seven months of dating. Jose claimed that his cheerful, modern, and smart personality won Rosanna over. Soon after, they had a son named Geronimo. But not long after, problems began to show. Jose was a controlling and jealous man who often belittled Rosanna and her family. This abuse eventually became physical, leaving Rosanna feeling trapped and fearful. Jose's intimidating presence, reinforced by owning two guns, ensured he kept control, a situation that Rosanna's family was painfully aware of. It was common for Jose to show off his guns, either when someone visited their home or when he was out visiting others. One time while painting their house, Rosanna's brother Oscar witnessed Jose physically assaulting her, telling her to shut up before hitting her. On another occasion, her father noticed bruises on Rosanna's back, and she simply told him that Jose had dragged her across the pavement. Despite these troubles, Rosanna and Jose welcomed their second child, and Rosanna tried her best to make the relationship work, hoping to provide a stable home for their children. However, her efforts were constantly undermined by Jose's temper and disrespectful behavior. To make matters worse, Jose's mother, Elsa, controlled the household from afar, making decisions about their lives during her short visits to Argentina. By 2006, Rosana had endured unbearable abuse and finally reported Jose for domestic violence. Her family was largely unaware of the full extent of her suffering. 
Months later, Rosanna filed a second complaint, including a request for a medical examination due to her injuries. Following this, she opened up to her sister Monica, and they made a pact to communicate whenever something happened. Monica became her sanctuary and support. Whenever life with Jose became unbearable, Rosanna would visit Monica's apartment with her children, though Jose dictated when they must return, often with death threats. At times, he verbally abused Rosanna, criticizing her abilities as a mother. Eventually, she decided to move in with Monica and the children, while Jose stayed at his house. After some time, Rosanna filed another complaint and sought a divorce, resulting in a restraining order against Jose. They only met at a neutral property in El Remanso, Exaltación de la Cruz, for child visitation, as arranged by the court. It was there that Rosanna shared the extent of her ordeal with the gardener. Daniel Gonzalez, who lived nearby, was married and had a daughter. Rumors suggested a secret romance between Rosanna and Daniel, but this was never confirmed. Jose's threats continued, and Rosanna even played a voicemail for her brother Oscar in which Jose talked about killing her. In mid-2007, while hanging out with friends at a bar, Rosanna met Oscar Lugo. He was 32, lived in Marino, and worked in a sewing workshop. They hit it off immediately, exchanged numbers, and started dating. Oscar Lugo was old-fashioned, a gentleman who was kind, attentive, and listened to her. For 29-year-old Rosanna, who had been through endless turmoil, it felt like she was rediscovering a nearly forgotten life. Oscar Lugo noticed Rosanna's lack of confidence and the fear in her. By December 2007, he had joined her for the holiday festivities, even dressing up as Santa Claus to delight her sons. But the happiness was marred by Jose, who kept tabs on Rosanna's every move. Aware of her new relationship and panicked by the looming divorce, Jose called Rosanna, offering her a truck to end things with Oscar Lugo. She refused, and it was her new boyfriend who accompanied her to the hospital during a severe nervous breakdown. Out of options, Jose hatched a plan, financed by his mother, Elsa. They meticulously arranged to hire a hitman whose identity remains a mystery. On January 16, 2008, Rosanna and her sister Monica went to El Remanso to pick up her sons, age four and three. The handover was delayed by Jose with excuses. At 9.15 p.m., Jose called, claiming Geronimo had a fever and he would take him to the hospital and return him the next day. However, Rosanna insisted on having the children back to care for Geronimo herself. The call was brief, and then she went inside. Around 9.53 p.m., Rosanna texted Oscar Lugo with a casual message about their plans for the next day. At 10 p.m., Rosanna and Monica sat down for dinner. At 10.50 p.m., Jose called again, and this conversation turned into a deadly trap. Rosanna went out to the garden for better reception, where a shadowy figure emerged from behind the trees and shot her four times with a .45 caliber gun. Hearing the shots, Monica screamed, saw Rosanna stagger and collapse. Frantic, Monica tried calling 911 without success, then asked her boyfriend to alert the police. Meanwhile, Oscar Lugo, unaware of the events, tried contacting Rosanna at 11 p.m. and failing that, tried to reach Monica but got no response. Police investigations revealed that the shooter had entered from an adjacent vacant lot. A witness saw someone fleeing through a gap in the fence but couldn't provide a clear description due to the darkness. That night, Jose was questioned and appeared shocked. After requesting a lawyer, he let the lawyer handle the proceedings and left. The next day, during further searches, a red sweater was found 
which Rosanna's relatives believed belonged to Jose, making him the prime suspect in their eyes. The case grabbed media attention and shocked the country, becoming scandalous as Jose and his mother publicly claimed his innocence and talked bad about Rosanna, suggesting she had multiple lovers and those men should be investigated instead. After the incident, Daniel, the gardener, became reclusive, speaking to no one. On the night of Rosanna's funeral, Reynaldo noticed Jose nearby in a truck, watching from a distance without joining or expressing condolences. Jose's defense later targeted Monica, Rosanna's sister and the sole witness, raising doubts about her by questioning why there were no bloodstains on her clothes and why she ran for her phone instead of helping her sister. However, this theory was unsupported. The investigators argued the weapon was too heavy for a woman to manage. An important point raised by the detectives was that anyone familiar with the house would know Rosanna needed to go outside to get a cell signal, indicating significant premeditation in the crime. During the investigation, Rosanna's sons were cared for by their father and grandmother Elsa, while their grandmother Graciela could see them. However, Monica and Oscar were denied access with Jose claiming serious safety concerns for his sons. Despite the legal restrictions, the children expressed a desire to see their Aunt Monica, leading Jose to occasionally allow visits. Monica used these opportunities to take them to a psychologist. Eventually, Graciela obtained visitation rights, though not guardianship. In an interview at the time, Jose alleged that Rosanna had four lovers, all with legal troubles. According to Jose, Rosanna was intimate with these men to uncover their secrets, which she then used to blackmail them for benefits. Meanwhile, after receiving threats, Oscar was made a protected witness in his sister's case, requiring him to wear a tracking bracelet and being assigned police protection. As 2007 was ending, the investigators had yet to find solid evidence to charge any of the suspects. However, a significant turn came a year after the murder when Jose was arrested in January 2008, charged with aggravated homicide due to their relationship, premeditation, and the involvement of two or more people. The preliminary hearings began on January 28, 2008. Reynaldo, Graciela, Monica, and Oscar testified about Jose's repeated threats, violent nature, and use of firearms for intimidation. The mother also presented the last text messages from her daughter to the prosecutor. After the hearing, Reynaldo expressed feeling a heavy burden but found relief in fulfilling his duty to his daughter's memory. The next day, Oscar Lugo, Rosanna's former boyfriend, testified against Jose, describing him similarly to the family's view. He mentioned Jose's attempts to tarnish his and Rosanna's reputations, adding that Rosanna believed Jose's claims of her having multiple lovers were a tactic to discredit her in their impending divorce. Jose's lawyer downplayed the allegations of Jose's emotional instability and aggression, suggesting they were echoing Rosanna's narrative. On February 7, 2008, a 12-hour investigative session took place, with Jose's mother traveling from the United States for her turn to testify. Meanwhile, a new search at El Remanso yielded no new evidence. By then, Rosanna's family suspected her mother-in-law's involvement in the plot. As a result, Reynaldo and Graciela's lawyer considered requesting her arrest. In defense, Jose and his mother's lawyer argued that Jose's mother had stated in her testimony that she bought houses for her grandchildren, believing the divorce settlement would not harm them. It was also added that it was untrue that Jose's mother and Rosanna had a bad relationship. The media continued to debate the circumstances of Rosanna's death and the notion that Jose orchestrated the murder, hinting at another perpetrator. Despite the suspicions, 
Jose was released on bail and took care of his children. Later, the court deemed the police protection for Oscar, Rosanna's brother who worked as a taxi driver, unnecessary. On the early morning of July 5th, 2008, Oscar was attacked by two armed men. They beat and threatened him for an hour before abandoning him in a vacant lot, where he was found thanks to his protective witness tracking bracelet. Though not severely injured, he was deeply shaken. Amidst the grief of losing Rosanna and the ongoing custody battle, the family faced renewed fear, a fear that was palpable and justified. With no one convicted and ongoing threats, the demand for justice grew more urgent, yet the judicial system's slow pace was disheartening. Years passed, and by 2012, the trial and custody dispute dragged on. Four years after the attack, Oscar used his visitation rights to take his nephews to play soccer, sharing a memorable hug with the six- and seven-year-old boys. In April 2013, the oral trial started. Jose maintained his innocence. In May, proceedings were delayed when Jose suffered a stroke, pushing the final verdict to November 2013. The judges found that the murder was meticulously planned, resembling organized crime. Jose and Elsa were implicated in choosing the time and place for the attack, knowing that a phone call would lure Rosanna outside, making her vulnerable. The court found financial motives behind the murder, as Jose did not want to split the marital assets. Jose and Elsa were sentenced to life imprisonment. The conviction was upheld by the higher court, highlighting Jose's threats, the domestic violence endured by Rosanna, and the dominant influence of his mother. The actual shooters were never identified. In 2015, Jose and Elsa received house arrest, Jose due to his health and Elsa due to her age, allowing the kids to live with them again. The media continued to cover the children's story for years, during which time Monica and Graciela had no contact with them. The boys shuffled between homes known to their father but strangers to Rosanna's family. In the second week of January 2017, the court allowed the children to spend a weekend with their maternal grandparents for the first time. The Galliano family prepared their home with fresh paint, a thorough cleaning and decorations. They hung balloons and made a colorful welcome sign. Graciela prepared their favorite dish. That weekend, the Galliano home was filled with joy as the boys played soccer, video games, and even asked to sleep in their grandmother's bed, whom they hadn't seen in over two years. On November 24, 2018, Jose died after another stroke. The event was another blow for the children, who attended their father's funeral. During the funeral, they expressed their concern about their future with their Aunt Monica. She assured them with calmness and love, promising to support whatever they decided. They chose to live with Monica, who then had to confront Elsa to communicate the boy's decision. Through these and many other instances, it was clear that Monica always acted in alignment with her nephew's wishes, whether they wanted to talk or preferred silence. Monica's primary goal was to provide stability and comfort for the boys. In March 2019, Geronimo chose not to change schools since he was close to his friends and had two years left there, so he went back to live with his grandmother Elsa. Meanwhile, Monica sought custody of the other kid. Things seemed to be stabilizing, but in the last week of November 2019, 87-year-old Elsa was moved from her home to the hospital, where she passed away on November 30th. The following month, Monica was granted custody of Nehuen. By year's end, Geronimo moved in with a friend of his grandmother. Both brothers continued to need psychological support to process their experiences, with Geronimo struggling with depression. Their psychologist noted the overwhelming succession of events they faced. In March 2020, 
Just before pandemic restrictions started, the person Geronimo was living with passed away, leading him to seek refuge with his Aunt Monica until October 2020. Upon turning 18, Geronimo rented a small apartment and lived independently, supported by income from his inherited properties. Monica began legal proceedings to secure their inheritance, fearing they might be deprived of their assets. Maywen, meanwhile, showed emotional stability thanks to the support he received and was encouraged to return to therapy whenever needed. And so, dear viewers, this concludes today's episode of Unreal True Crime. Don't forget to subscribe and like if you appreciate my work. Good night and see you in the next crime story.